welcome to Old School Bleep. podcast all about Springfield, old school and new school, punk rock and original music from here, and who better to tell you about that than the three of us, and who are we anyway? Um, I'm Jeff Williams, uh, I was uh, in a band called Annihilate, well I'm still in the band Annihilate, we just haven't played in quite a while. My name is Scott Fingold. I've been playing in bands uh, in Springfield since the early 80s. Push that foot. Pull that lever. The boys are down on our arms so clear. Keep that pizza. Kill that chicken. It's all toxic. And you're stricken. And you can wrap your pants over to the logical man. Damon Soper. Damon. So basically we're just here because there's a lot of history here in town with this music and the scene and the culture and we're just uh, want to make sure that it's preserved somewhere because really we get together and you know that just we just start running our mouths and running our memories mm -hmm. and there's always a ton of stories but they just go off into the ether so we thought we'd share it with everybody out there and hopefully they'd want to hear and also uh you know once we uh, exhaust this original trio we hope to have other members of the the scene historically uh you know to come in and people who are in it currently and just kind of have this be a space for uh, people to appreciate and uh, reminisce and plan for the music in Springfield. Dr. No was from Oxnard, California, so there was this whole movement there called Nardcore, and they were like probably the premier band of that, but they were also a little bit different than the other bands. They, they kind of had more of a metal-ish sort of an edge, and for some reason they, they, there was they couldn't find anybody that kind of fit with them, I guess, over in um, in the sh Champaign area at the, at the time. And so they just, uh, somehow they messaged us. This is when Steve McDaniel was playing drums with us and Terry Wilson was still singing. I was still too spooked to try to, um, to sing and play guitar at the same time and my brother was playing bass. And we, yeah, we got to open for Dr. No over, over there. Now, this was just a house party, but because we played that house party and there was a lot of people there, then after that, Chris Corpora did start to kind of, you know, he, he got us on a show. And there was also a guy, I can't remember his last name, his name was Sasha, but he would um, book us sometimes at Mabel's or Trino's or Tritos. It was Tritos. Okay. Tritos, too. Okay. Was, was it, was, I think it was just Tritos. was the place that was right next to me. Right. right. But there was another place called Trinos. There was a place called Trinos, too. There was, okay. It was kind of... But it was, so that was kind of weird to me, also. But but anyhow, so Chris Corp would get us some good... He'd get, get, get us some good shows, you know? So we'd start to play kind of at Mabel's. Um, we opened for a band called I Love You... Uh, Titanic Love Affair, which was from from there, and uh, the, yeah, the, the guy who ended up in Look Up, right? uh, uh, I, I think so. Then I wasn't, I can't remember exactly the, yeah. the, the history on that. But actually, we did play with Wilco. Uh, I'm sorry, we played with Uncle Tupelo oh, okay. over in Champagne, also. So, so we kind of somehow just managed. It seemed like it was because of the Doctor No show. But then we got to get over there and play with the, with some of these other bands. Now, the one time that we did screw up pretty bad, this was a little bit later, was um, Chris had asked us 
this Chris Corper, he's like, hey, and he put in this demo tape, you know, and we were listening to it, and he's like, and we were playing like about every two months, he'd have us back over there. And so he's like, um, we've got the next show after this, we've got the Afghan Weeks coming, if you don't open for them. Um, and we were like, what? Oh my God, yeah, because Afghan Weeks at that point were big, they were big, so this was gonna be our biggest show. They're like, or if you want, like the night before, the couple days before, is this band, this de- you know, this demo that's playing right now. It's like, man, this, this is kind of cool sounding. And it was, it was Nirvana. It was the, the demo that was going to be bleached later, right? So this is how long ago this was. Was that? It, it, it's crazy to think how long, how long ago a lot of this stuff happened. Because even though what I'm telling you was a long time ago, we'd still been around for a while before this. Because the stories we've been talking about already were before before that had happened. But we listened, and we were like, "Man, this band, this they sound cool, but." We're gonna go with Afghan Wigs, yeah. man. I was like, so so we went and opened for them because it was a sold out show, and then we asked. So it must have been that Nirvana maybe they played the night before, and so we you know we passed on that, and so we then asked after the show was done. We we're like, oh man, it was a great show. How was the you know how was this the, the how was that Nirvana band you know? And he's like, oh, there was like maybe twelve people there, you know what I mean? <laughs> they had like you know they had a people who kind of knew them that had come out that, you know, from when, maybe when Dave Grohl was still back in D.C. or whatever it happened to be. But the thing is, it was weird because then years later, I remember then, or not years later, but then getting Bleach, and I was like, man, this is crazy. And then I remember the first time I listened to about the first three notes when Nevermind came out, and I was just like, we made a huge mistake. (laughs) I was in the band Flawless Catcher. Flawless Catcher. And that was like when I was 14, 15. And uh, <clears throat> Tom Armstrong. Right, Tom band. Armstrong, yeah. And Tom has gone on to have a Tom Armstrong a really good he had great music now. career. Yeah, he, uh, he was in a sort of a, a grunge era band called the Hollow Men that uh, played very heavy kind of psych rock. And they played, uh, they were really great. They um, did, did a lot of touring, played with bands like Sonic Youth and Screaming Trees. The country artist. Now country artist. Girls like you are far between and few. If I can make my dreams come true, do what I was born to do, spend a lifetime loving you, I'd be crazy not to. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. songs in that style of the classic 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, so, and he, he pulls that off, and he even had that background back then together, and he was the front person in that band. Oh, I, yeah, played, like that. I played bass in that band, and I did not know how to play bass. I just learned those songs. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, I went to bass lessons, and mm-hmm. they told me which, which, you know, what the names of the four strings were, and mm-hmm. basically how to tune it, mm-hmm. and then I was like, all right, now how do I play this song? Mm-hmm. And that was all I learned. I didn't, you know, I didn't was learn Tom that. showing you where to put your... Yeah, there's probably pictures. You know those pictures on the, <laughs> you see sometimes of uh, Paul Simonon from uh, The Clash yeah, see, with yeah. uh, Mick Jones tuning his bass for me. Right. That was our whole life. <laughs> right. It was like, I was, <laughs> I, I, I was, I was very, you know, it was like, I'm sure it was horribly frustrating. I mean, we were, we were great friends at the time we got, you know, we, but, but uh, the level of, uh, the levels of talent in terms of instrumental ability were just a huge chasm. Well, you know, he was a huge influence on me, whether he knew it or not. Just, I remember when when I first met Tom Armstrong, uh, 
he I I just I don't remember exactly what I said but he was playing guitar I don't even remember where it was uh, I don't think it was a party but it seemed like there were some people around but um, and I just said something like oh could you could you play Black Flag and he was he almost acted like well yeah I can play Black Flag and he immediately he did jealous again like exactly like Greg Ginn played played it guitar solo and everything just by himself like nonchalantly did the whole thing it's like well i mean i, I can but i don't know if I, you know what i mean it was weird and i was like what in the world because it blew my mind i was like i was trying to write my own songs and learned black flag songs or the circle jerk songs or you know bad brains minor threat stuff like this and he just came up like nonchalant like well i mean i can and, brrr, and he did the whole like solo and everything just like great get I couldn't believe it. Something like that, but the Disciples of Chaos also, DOC also got there. Yeah, but, um, well, backwards, like, we used to just come and great. do almost all our stuff. All these stuff did. We would just, Jim and I would just hang out while you were behind the counter at... Uh, yes, yeah. working there. And let me tell you, this is another thing. Speaking of that, the best, and you're going to know immediately here, the best thing i ever had to help put together at original copy company Mm -hmm. was jim schneep's calendar that he made because there was only one date in the whole in the whole calendar it had no dates no holidays no nothing the only birthday it had on in it was Laura Palmer's birthday <laughs> from, Twin <laughs> from, from Twin Peaks. That was the only... It was so funny to me yeah. because you'd flip through this whole thing and the only only one thing was marked, only one thing, and it was Laura Palmer's birthday from Twin Peaks. So according to Tom Kinney, who had worked at Apple Tree, was yep. a teacher at Southeast, yep, yep. was in Condition 90, um, it was Larry Lenkart who set up the... Um, the Rock Against Reagan. He at least emceed it, if not set up. Larry, Larry did MC it, but so he he, he wasn't, he wasn't, he the, wasn't one the one who set it, it up it. exactly. Because I totally remember Larry mm-hmm. from working back and he with did the, Ron. And, 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 he, and he had that sandwich shop, right? Didn't he? Wasn't he the Larry worked at Jimmy's Jimmy's and he, sub shop, right. which was um, which um, was right there on the corner mm-hmm. of like uh sixth mm. and monroe yeah, right. was yeah. it right yep. yeah yeah right there yeah and actually because we we you used to do one shows one dollar like, shows yeah, which we'd announce like three crazy. hours in advance yeah, me and, and then it would just be the whole the, oh, just, the street was like yeah. closed down i went, like, I went there like one it was like one dollar shows yeah. yeah you can't right. get in there yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah me and jim played a duo show there during the back yeah 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 we went we played that was great the jimmy we played a gigantic joe we played as gigantic jones and treasure that's right Right, treasure. That's right. Good old treasure. treasure. And Jimmy's so, Jimmy Sub Shop. That's great. Jimmy yeah. Sub Shop. So, so Jimmy's. Um, but that was Larry. Larry would book the shows. Or he was Larry would book the shows. Jimmy owned it, and mm-hmm. Jimmy's son was later in Resident Genius. Um, and what was the band before Resident Genius was? Uh, Seething Coast. Or I'm yeah, sorry, so Seething, Seething, Seething Coast after. Yeah, sorry, afterwards. Right. So, yeah, um, which yeah. I ended up being. Right, you were in, in that band. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Jason right. will have a lot of stories to tell. We should definitely. Jason will have to come. Yes, yeah. exactly. When I was with Seething Coast, we went up to Chicago and recorded the album Olympia with Steve Albini. He's probably best known for recording engineering the Nirvana album In Utero. <laughs> Lincoln Land, I, I met uh, Jeff Cunningham in a music theory class, and he said he was putting together a band, and you know, um, he was, they were forming a classic rock band with a guy that was opening up, he had a music store in town, he was kind of a small little spot uh, behind a garage, 
um, but he was moving it to Jefferson. Um, his name is Sam Giordano, and his uh, music store was going to be called The Rock Shop. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, Sam, Jeff, uh, Jim Crowley, and he had played in bands like Sky High, and he they, they were all playing out regularly. And I go to this practice. I went from, you know, the Sullivans to these guys that are just like... Sam was like playing with Jeff Beck. They were just flawless musicians, and I, I, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I'll try to sing and do what I can. The uh, musical theater stuff. Um, I did West Side Story. Because that's when you first met Bruce, right? Well, I, I'd, I'd met Bruce because we had done shows together, but we weren't like, you know, formally introduced. And I went up to him when he was in the orchestra pit. And the orchestra pit was made up of an all-star band of, you know, Henry Miles, um, Sam Crane, oh, Gary Niehaus, just the top musicians in town. And, and your brother played, you know, this Leonard Bernstein music, which is not easy. Um, and so I was like, you know, while everybody else is like doing their lines or whatever, if I get a break, I'm going to go talk to the musicians because... <laughs> And the Sullivans end up playing the uh, cast party for West Side Story. West Side Story. You were Tony, right? Yeah, I was. I was Tony. The uh, uni show. I was the uh, Elvis, uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Matt Rick Dunham. They had me, you know, meet him, and he gave me some pointers on how to pull off an Elvis impersonation. Rick Dunham, by the way, is Elvis Elvis himself. himself. He's been performing as Elvis himself longer than I believe Elvis Presley was alive. At At least his performing career. His performing career was like 56 to 77, so Mm -hmm. he's way past that. So I went went to North Texas for a while. Yeah, which Um, we would stay with you down there. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking 95, Mm -hmm. um, 94, 95. So they had me studying um, classical uh, singing. And so I had to learn how to sing opera. We'd get in these groups, and we'd have to take turns like around and mm-hmm. you know sing. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, this is always my criticism was I would sing, you know, and it would be "Quando ti rivedrò in vide monte che mi fosse secara," you know, and they would they'd be like, "Yeah." But you sound like a pop singer. Oh, you, really? You, huh. you still kind of sound like a rock singer. Like they huh. would always. Like you're you gotta, get, like, you gotta yeah. get rid of that, and so they were always on me about that. Right, um, right. But uh, well, I'm glad you're covering this because <laughs> because that's the thing is there's so many times where people it's like the first time people hear you sing, especially like if you all of a sudden do it like at a party or something, and people hear you, they are like. I mean, it's like they're shocked. They right. can't even believe it. It's when you hear you, like you, you take your, you do your uh, Brian James Dio thing at an ILH show. Doing a whole set of other bands, you did Eddie Van Halen and David Lee Roth simultaneously. You know, oh, I right. don't think Which it was is crazy. Kind of Van yeah, Halen tribute. Crazy. I mean, you could most people couldn't do either of those, let alone both at the same time. Those injectors as Van Halen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
time, you know, your voice cuts through in a way that most rock, I mean, it's like most rock singers, especially on the level that, you know, we're performing at, just don't have that range and power to like stick in there. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the schooling helped. Yeah, I, we always I do it or yeah. not, you it, know. It, 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 well, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. it comes through. There's um, no doubt about it. Because I remember like back when, uh, you know, when you, when with the soul pudding and stuff, you know, people would be like, how? This sounds better than Soundgarden. I they're like, like right. I just went and saw Soundgarden play. And you're doing better than, and it's like this yeah. sounds better than That's Soundgarden, like, especially if it's people who were who were coming to the show and they didn't really know much about you, but they were like from out of town or something like that. I remember that happening at Bootleggers one time, and somebody was talking to me about that, and they're like. What? Who is playing? And the because it was packed, you know, so you couldn't really see. Yeah, you could just hear it. Bootleggers. And so uh, somebody's like, "Wait a minute, who, who's playing over there? This is crazy. It sounds." I just went to see Soundgarden. Jesus Christ pose, I was like, they were not doing this right now. I was like, are you kidding me? This is, because that's, a, you know what I mean? Yeah. That song has a certain sound. I mean, that's just not like a get in there and kind of, there's a, it's a very, I mean, a lot of the songs you did were insanely complex songs with Will Howie. I mean, the whole band was, yeah, was yeah. just, the musicianship it was, was, it was crazy. It was good to have the good musicians. And you were down there with. You were in you were down there with Jeff, Jeff Cunningham, Cunningham, right? Did both of you? Because that's what we were there. Yeah, Jeff. And was you both ended up back here eventually, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Actually. we got back here. Um, you know, Matt was still here from the you know Matt from the Sullivans, and he's like, I'm thinking about putting this uh, rockabilly band together. <laughs> um, you know, we formed the band Los Injectors. Well, we used to party down the river, man. Little old ball, cup of sand, come out the woods and shoot it down. same time i was uh, playing with uh my friends in a blink and continental Schmitty and we did Hell's Half Acre around that time. Trello shows up where I was teaching music lessons and he's like, hey, come down here and Gary's down there, Gary Brammer and Trello, and they both like kind of had me cornered and was like, hey, we want you to play mm -hmm. in MAG. And I know MAG because we had uh, done shows with them, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be Los Injectors or um, whoever, and, you know, with uh, Matt McKay, mm -hmm. Andy Trello, and Gary Brammer. And, mm -hmm. Mag was a fantastic thing. <laughs> so yes. talk about Mag. I mean, I was actually gone during the entire period of Mag, so I didn't really experience Mag except maybe in a, a, 
a reunion at some point. So, uh, so explain the whole mag ethos. Like this escape because it sort of had this surf feel. Like, I mean, grammar was a surf, like surf. I mean, like crazy. Like dick joke. And well, it, it wasn't really that, but it was just sort of like the grammar. It was like all of a sudden having like some like ocean beach in central Illinois. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It just had this feel, kind of 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 Southern California style. Um, some of the bands coming because it was you didn't really sound like like no effects and stuff like that but kind of you could have t- toured with them you know what I mean it would have been a cool mix but then also something else there was this little bit of this surf there was just this surf kind of thing that was going on and when you guys would play it just was like it it just um it was very easy for everybody there to just get really really into this three-piece thing that kind of was it was fun didn't seem you weren't like taking it too seriously but at the same time it was just the songs were great man you know and so it was just kind of cool to hear how it would unfold you guys would just get so so into it and it was uh i don't know yeah, man. gary gary could get a crowd and like he could get a crowd into us uh, he was good on the mic and he's just he, he would just be himself right and talk and it, to the crowd and just it's just like you're hanging right. out having a beer at a party I'm I'm quiet, but you guys gotta sing the shit i've got an earache and you guys are making this i'm sick of hearing that motherfucker sing man Kind of had like a David Lee Roth kind of, you know, because David Lee Roth's from California, you know, and they kind of had that, hey, you know, hey, what's up? You know, you know? dude, you know, it's going to get sicky, bro, you know, just going to go ahead and do, hey, we're, we're Mag from uh, from Grandview, Illinois. And these other fucking motorcycles around here. That is the quietest fucking motorcycle channel I've ever heard in my life. There must be only two people from the North End, me and Andy. You know what I mean? Which was also, to me, was hilarious that he'd say, he just would say Grandview. Yes. You know, it's from Grandview, <laughs> not Springfield. I, I, was, I remember the first time him saying that. He's wearing like an IGA shirt. Anyway, two words in this song. Charlie, you got to sing first. Charlie, you got to sing first. Charlie, you got to sing first. It was just, I mean, obviously, I knew all you guys too. Just because you're in Mag doesn't mean you're something special. <laughs> but I was just like, this is great. I mean, I loved it, man. It was- you invited me. It was a band with Jay. 
And I sang a Buzzcock song on stage with you guys at oh. Bar None. I did uh, oh. 16. Oh, that was uh, Fast Orange. Orange. Fast Orange. Fast I just Orange. I was forgetting That's the right. name. Fast Orange. Orange. Yeah. yeah. And Robbie from the Timmies was in Fast yeah. Orange also, yeah. right? Yeah. Actually, the Timmies, I played bass with those guys. I was supposed to fill in on bass for a show or two. And I ended up playing with them for uh, almost nearly two years. So then, Gary, you know, Gary was decided to leave town. Yeah, and kind of left a hole in an eye. And he call, well, he called me. He's like this. He goes, dude, you know, man, I, dude, I don't want to leave you hanging like this, dude. You know, we got to fill the gap. We got to find the right person, dude. You know, he was like taking ownership and finding. He like felt bad that he was, you know, that he was leaving because at that point he's moving to Portland, right? He moved out to Portland for a while, then to Vegas, but. Um, and he's like, dude, you gotta, you gotta have Damon, Damon play. And I was like, really, Damon? I was like, you know what I mean? And the weird thing was, at that point, I hadn't even really, I hadn't even really thought about it because I was still kind of stunned from him. He was going to leave, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so, uh, I don't even know how it just we started to talk, and you know, like all of a sudden, like, yeah, let's let's try this. Well, We tried to get this. I had photos from the show, though. We tried to get. We wanted to do a show for all ages because we always had underage kids trying when to come to our shows. When, 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 it was something like 1990. It's around all the time Focus came out. And so that was when we were playing. It was kind of across from. It was. It was like stage two, I think. Stage two was that the same place where By George was and over this, there and. Uh, off Stevenson? Yeah, yeah. I it was okay. Oh, by, then by that's not what I'm thinking at all. Yeah, it was called, yeah, it was called Stage It's two, where we right? played with uh, uh, Ice-T. Oh, that God. Place. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. Yeah, anyway. later that was Club Chrome. That's oh, what it was man. called later. Oh, yeah. yeah. Later. Back in, they called it Four Seasons or something, that area back it there was or something. It's, if that's the Lake one Victoria. I'm thinking. Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria, that's exactly, yep, and that's right. It, Lake Victoria. I remember it was by George. All ages club when I was uh, oh yeah a you know we're talking eighty five eighty six so it, was, so it became stage two after that it became stage two yeah we played club chrome later with iced tea iced tea vanilla and, ice one and time vanilla and vanilla ice tea but not the same show not no same show. totally separate shows but the, the thing is Gary Swaggerty was filling in on drums for us walnuts. Oh, because Wes couldn't do it because he was going to his to like either his uh, Matt's wedding, his brother's wedding, or something like that, and he couldn't do it. And so we're like, God, man, we're gonna have to miss out on opening for iced tea, you know. And so we started, and so it's like, hey, 
Gary, man. <laughs> He's like, what do you want? <laughs> you know? And I was like, um, we got a chance to open for... We could open for iced tea, you know? And he goes, bullshit. <laughs> and I don't know. We could. if you, but, but Wes is out of town. Jesus Christ, let me go find my Viking hat. <laughs> you know, he was like, he, and so I said, and so, but that whole show, the thing is this, Ice-T wasn't around. It for, I mean, he was there, but then he was gone, right? And what they did was the way the, the show was set up, which was kind of cool, was they had more like an R&B or hip hop or, you know, a rap act, I should say, an R&B or a rap act. Then like kind of a like a rock style act, then back to a R and B or a rap act, then us, then Ice T was gonna come out. But he, he caught our last song. He did catch our last song. <laughs> then that's what I was gonna get to that whole thing. But so as it's going on, I can't remember it was the one guy who promoted it and he's like, Man, we haven't seen that Ice T for a little bit and I go She go, Don't I was like, Hey, to Gary, to Walnuts, I was like, dude, don't say anything on stage about the fact that he's not here right now. Because you didn't, you had Springfield people, you had Decatur people, because some of the bands came from Decatur, and you have some East Saint people who came up because they're, they're and they were like younger acts, who came up like with their, with their grandmamas, you know what I mean, who were there, they were there on the side of the stage. And as far as they were concerned, they were there to see Finn. Right, you know what I mean, Finn from Law and Order, and some of them. You know what I mean. That's what some of the the older the older folks were there to, to like, because that's how they kind of had the connection, I think. But when so I was like, Gary standing there, I think he had the Viking helmet on or one of his helmets, and I go, dude, you can't say anything about the fact that he's not here because these people are all going to. You got the Springfield people, you got these other people, and some of them might somebody might be like, no, I can't, I can't, no, no, no. I can't. I didn't came to see this nonsense annihilate band or this opening stuff. I want to see I see. And now you're saying he's not here. I was like, don't say anything about it. Just keep your big fat mouth shut about that for, about this. And he goes, motherfucker, you better just take the goddamn mic away from me. Because there's no way I'm going to keep my mouth shut about it. Just take the mic away. So I told Skippy, I was like, Skippy, get that mic out of here before we started playing. We don't want it. And then we got there and played. I was sweating like a pig. I remember running off the stage, and, and right when I did, I saw there was Ice T was standing there, and I think Coco was next. Yeah. To him. And so as I ran past him, I couldn't help it. I was just like, "Hey man, you know," I kind of gave him the "What's up," you know, and he's like, "Yo, good job." <laughs> <laughs> it was great, man. That's the best moment. Yo, good job. <laughs> Yeah, but you took a bunch of pictures with him and Coco. I, I just got one. A I one? one? I just I got some, but it was, I remember that one, man. That was like gold. I have it up on my wall, yeah. <laughs> I blanked on that. There were so many times I blank on shows like that where I was like, man, why didn't I get, why didn't I go take a picture of this person or talk to or get an autograph? He talked to him he some. Was super nice. He was really nice. Super I know afterwards I was like, man, because I was, I was like, man, I was, because they were like getting ready to bring him out. They were they didn't waste any time. No, no, no. Right. they was ready. They were like, and, they start, and his, his boys went out and they started kind of warming up the crowd. Agent Orange. And he was just standing there, waiting, and he even had a microphone. Oh, and he was saying stuff. He was a little yeah, agitated. You know, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. And he, but he wasn't out there. He wasn't out there yet. But he, Agent Orange was on there trying to hype the crowd. The, the crowd was hyped. Yeah, they were ready to go. And Agent, I think it was Agent Orange, and he was like this. Yo, Mr. Sound Man, turn the turn the mics up. I remember that. And Skippy was back there, and he's just like, "All right, I turn him. No, turn this up." And he was telling him to turn the PA, the, the monitors on the stage monitors up. And he kept and Skippy does. Skippy's like, "All right, I'll turn them up." He had them at. I mean, the peak, they were all that tapped out basically. And I just he came out and he played his first song. And he got through with the first song and the crowd was going crazy. And Ice-T just looked down and he goes, God damn. I'm about to say some fucked up shit. <laughs> Can't believe I'm gonna have to say this. Never said this before in my life. Mr. Sound Man.
turn this motherfucking shit down. <laughs> turn this shit way down. I was cracking up. <laughs> he, was so, he was so mad right off the bat because he, he told him to pump it up and Skippy's not thinking about it. It's just part of it, you know, just pump it to get the crowd. He's like just jacking that sound up in ice tea. He was blowing his head off. <laughs> <laughs> and then, late, then later on, then the, a couple of these women who were standing on the side of the stage, who were there with some of the younger earlier acts, because there was and there was a big use uh, horseshoe going on too, man, for a while, because people were just packed to the back. But this band was performing. But they're the they're the people who they came with these ladies um, who were a bit older. Um, they were on the side of the stage, but they started to get bold, and then because they were able to sit down the side, they started to get on the back of the stage and they're standing back there and they're kind of dancing you know what i mean mm -hmm. and in my mind i was like oh man and they kind of had a little bit of a the way they were dancing it sort of had a little bit of a, like a tina turner sort of a thing kind of going on the way they were they were dancing this sort of it was strange it was like mm, that's not it wasn't the greatest you know what i mean it wasn't the greatest but they were getting it you know and they were into it and so people are kind of pointing, like, oh, oh, my God, look back there. You know, like, oh, my God, check it out, you know. And so Ice-T was doing his song, and he's like, what the? So he turned and looked, and he just needed to look for a second. And as soon as that song got done, and the crowd is going crazy, and as soon as it calms down, and they're back there kind of, like, waving at the crowd and stuff, and he goes like this. Yo, Grams. <laughs> The family reunion is on Sunday, and they couldn't get off the stage fast enough because as soon as he said "Yo, Grams," they knew they were going. They were in trouble. They were in trouble with Ice T. Anyway, sorry, I got sidetracked there. Back when they did a show, we had a weekend at Fifth Monroe after at our period when we were booking. We were. Uh, filling these places. Mm -hmm. uh, we did it one night, the Hollow Men came in from Iowa, and the next night, the Poster Children came in from Champagne. Oh, geez, man. And those were our opening acts. Good Lord, Poster <laughs> Children. Fifth, fifth, fifth and Monroe. Monroe. <laughs> yeah, Fifth and Monroe. Poster Children and Fifth and Monroe. I don't know if I freaking went to that That was show, a weird man. thing. I don't know if we really knew that much about who they were. We knew that they were the the hot band that was coming up in Champagne. Champagne, they weren't signed right. right. The label yet, they weren't signed to Warners, but they, mm -hmm. were, they were the band to be. This is a matter of time Before you talk to me yet This is a matter of time Before you go to me yet And the problem with Champagne was that we couldn't get booked there. We could get booked in at the gallery in Bloomington. Bloomington, yeah. We got some decent shows even in St. Louis. We opened for the Bothell Servers in right, St. Louis. Right, right, right. Uh, really? <laughs> you didn't know about that either. That was quite a good thing. Yeah. Um, but, we, but when we went to, uh, you know, we could not, Champagne was just a closed world. And, um, you know, the Maples wouldn't sign, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't let us play. They would say, you know, and, and they were much more cynical there. They would just be like, um, oh, you know, it doesn't matter how good your tape is, it's whether you put people in the drink. You know, that was kind of, they said that to us straight up, which is, you know, always the economics of it, but um, theoretically, you play the music that's decent and people will come and maybe do what's in the bar. But people were very close, and um, this guy, uh, uh, Chris Corpora. Chris Corpora, yeah, exactly. He was the post over there. He was yeah. the poster children's manager. Mm -hmm. And um, we booked the show with them. The idea was audience trading to build up. Yep. We wanted to let them, because we had a big audience for Springfield anyway, mm -hmm. that place was full. And they came in and played. And then they, the idea was Chris was supposed to get us a show with the poster children mm -hmm. and Champagne, but never materialized. Mm -hmm. And so he kept on putting us on these weird shows. Um, one time we played with his two, it was like he had three bands he didn't know what to do with any of them, so we put them on the same bill. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, one of them was Nice Strong Arm, which is a really good sort of like proto grunge band.
mm-hmm. and then there's Kirk Kelly, who was just a solo sort of folk Dylan type act, you know, mm-hmm. that was his album was produced by Brian Ritchie from the Violent Films. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Just remember, we did the right thing. It's the price that we paid, let freedom ring. So as we enjoy what victory brings, we'll all join our voices together and sing. And us, and the three acts had nothing in common with each other. Mm-hmm. And none of them, and, the, and uh, you know, and nobody drew. We were playing to each other at the mm-hmm. show, mm-hmm. stories. Um, and it was finals week, so mm-hmm. nobody was no, out. Yeah. And... The Elvis Brothers were playing at Mabel's next Jesus. door. It was like the worst amount of all gay. And then we only needed gas money. But Little Engine paid the sound guy and didn't have any money left over to give us. It was like totally impenetrable. For and backwards. that's what's... For backwards, I just didn't... Nobody wanted us there. What's so weird to me is that, is it seemed like... Because when we play there, I felt like you w- would have, in a way, fit in with shows better than we did. It was sort of a strange thing. Yeah. That, I mean, I was... I, there were little weird walls that we would hit, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't really know what... The, what the reasons were behind it. You know, that poster children thing was odd because it seemed like we had a really good show with them. Right. I remember we had a lot of people there. I think we actually gave them a little extra money because we had done really well. Right. Maybe that was it. Where are you? I dreamed I was the vice president. 